The saying goes, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to do this. But today's guest on Feel Like You Belong actually is a rocket scientist. Yuki Takahashi has a physics degree from Caltech, a master's degree from the University of Glasgow, and a PhD from Cal Berkeley. His life interests, however, transcend the moon and the stars, and it is my great pleasure to welcome him to the studio today, remote from Hawaii. Yuki, thank you so much for making the time to talk with us. Hey, Alan. Yeah, thank you for inviting me. Now, Yuki, you were born in Carbondale, Illinois, and stayed there till age five. Were your parents studying at SIU at the time? Yeah, my father did his uh, master's at Southern Illinois University, and then uh, went on to PhD at University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. So yeah, for four years, and then we went back to Japan. So you've also lived in Ann Arbor in your life? Yeah, I don't remember too much of it. <laughs> So after your family moved back to Japan, you became interested in outer space. Talk about that time in your life. Oh, yeah. So this was when I was about nine years old. Uh, my parents took me to uh, the library, and I picked up uh, Astronomy Encyclopedia. That was very thick. And like, I started looking through it, and like, I read every page of it. Like it was like 200 pages, and I was just fascinated by all the pictures of the planets and the galaxies. So, yeah, that got me into astronomy. And then when I was like a couple years later, when I was 11, um, I picked up a book called "A Book That Will Get You Interested in Cosmology," <laughs> and that, yeah, I was like, I really got interested in the questions of like how the universe started, about um, and things like that. So then. I remember spending a lot of my money, <laughs> pocket money at the time, to buy Stephen Hawking's Brief History of Time. Yeah, and then reading that. Were you interested in reading Stephen Hawking in English or Japanese? This was in Jap Japanese. <laughs> okay. And then for a time, your parents actually moved back to the United States. Yeah, yeah. When I was 12, um, because of my uh, father's work, I went back to Michigan for two years. And he was working for the Dow Chemical Company. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And yeah, that changed my life, actually. Because, yeah, when I got to the US, I learned about like NASA and <laughs> even went to space camp. So that got me, like, I realized that the universe is not something that we can just observe, but we can actually potentially go. <laughs> so that got me interested in like being an astronaut and things like that. So how long was your family in the U.S. for the second time? Just for two years. Yeah. So you went back to Japan again, but in the back of your mind, you had a bigger idea. Yeah, actually, even before going back to Japan, I really wanted to stay in, in, uh, in the U.S. because I liked the schools a lot better. And also, I had the dream of becoming an astronaut, and I thought, the American education was better for me. So I tried to stay, but couldn't arrange everything on time, so I had to go back to Japan. So while back in Japan, I tried to work on like getting myself back in the US. So you were actually a very convincing person because you convinced your parents to let you go alone for your high school career in the United States. Talk about that. I, I was convinced that like, education in the U.S. would be better for me because in Japan, especially starting in like middle school or high school, the focus becomes like studying for entrance exams. And that was not what I wanted to do. Um, yeah, I wanted to, I liked in the U.S. like the very, um, the freedom to study like what you are interested in, pursue your interest, and also, um, yeah, train your creativity. So that's, what I wanted. So I convinced my parents, they agreed that it would be better for me. So yeah, they helped me. And you chose Midland, Michigan to return to because you knew that town. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the main reason. Um, I liked the school system there already and I already knew some people. So yeah. And so you were able to arrange over those last three years, three different host families to take you in. Yeah, that was mostly by chance. I mean, the first family uh, we were planning to, I was planning to stay with them uh, the whole time, 
but then um, at the end of the toward the end of the year, um, we had a grandparent, like a, a 87 year old grandpa who was becoming very ill, and they were not able to take care of me because um, yeah, so that's why I had to find another family. But yeah, it was really good experience actually, like living with different families. And really, living day to day with a family, kind of like an exchange student, makes you perfectly fluent in English. Yeah, well, it was a struggle trying to learn English, but uh, yeah, I guess that helped. We had the pleasure of meeting during your high school career in Midland, and I remember your high school induction to the National Honor Society. Your personal statement read that you had two goals in life to play tennis on the moon, and to enter a black hole. Can you explain that? Man, I didn't even remember that I put that down. <laughs> um, yeah, the tennis part <laughs> was kind of almost a joke, but the moon, I really, I was very fascinated. I loved, I really wanted to go to the moon because, um, yeah, I thought the moon is something that if more people paid attention to the moon, um, they would have a bigger perspective about our existence back on Earth. So that was one of my passions. And you were actually a tennis player at Midland High School. Yeah, yeah. So I thought it'd be fun to play tennis on the moon in <laughs> smaller gravity. And then the black hole, I was, um, yeah, reading Stephen Hawking's book and studying about black hole, I was really curious about like, man, what would it be like to go into a black hole? <laughs> so at the end of my life, like when I'm very old and did everything I wanted, I thought, oh, maybe I'll try to go into the black hole when I'm ready to die. <laughs> yeah. The final scientific experiment, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So in the first few years of your life, you were immersed in both English and Japanese. You also chose to study Spanish and Russian. Well, Russian was uh, because um, I wanted to become an astronaut and I wanted to be able to work with uh, Russian cosmonauts uh, because I really believed in like uh, international cooperation for space exploration, for like more peace and understanding. So that, that was why. Um, so I spent the summer in Russia and tried to learn about their culture and the language. Um, Spanish, I, um, because um, during spring breaks every year in college, I did a community service in a town in Mexico, uh, in a little village. And so I wanted to be able to communicate with the local people there, so I tried to learn a little bit of Spanish. <laughs> but you have subsequently done some professional work in South America, correct? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I worked on um, uh, setting uh, on a telescope uh, in the Atacama Desert of Chile, in the northern Chile, where it's very high altitude and very one of the driest places on Earth. Yeah. So you had a chance to use your Spanish there. Yeah, yeah, it was so fun trying to like uh, learn the new language and trying to use it. Um, yeah, I really enjoyed that. One of the things that people learn once they get to know you is that you've traveled to all seven continents, which includes Antarctica which a lot of world travelers cannot claim. How many times have you been there? Oh, um, so actually in total, I've been to Antarctica five times so far. Uh, the first four times was actually for my PhD project, which was to set up a telescope uh, at the South Pole. This telescope that we developed in California, it was to study the Big Bang. So yeah, I went there uh, two to three months at a time uh, for four years. And then um, the fifth time was uh, when I spent the winter at the Palmer Station, which is on the Antarctic Peninsula. And it's a much smaller station with about 20 of us winter overs. I was a communications technician responsible for all the communication on station, like satellite for internet and radios for communication around the station. Yeah. On this last trip, you weren't a graduate student. You were actually working. Yeah. Um, my, uh, the, the company who hired me was uh, called GHG, but it was, it's a logistics contractor for the Antarctic Support Contract. It's part of the National Science Foundation. What's one thing that you could tell our viewers who probably will never travel to Antarctica? 
<laughs> well, it's it's a very uh, I'd say it's like a different world and it's very peaceful place because it's not like owned by any country, no boundaries, borders, or anything like that. It's kind of like uh, the moon in a way, and very surreal because everything, depending on where you are, it's very white and <laughs> flat with snow everywhere and then a Palmer station there. I loved it because there were like penguins and seals everywhere. <laughs> they were very cute. Did you ever run into a polar bear? No, actually that's one of the <laughs> uh, misconceptions about the South Antarctica. Polar bears are in the north, in the Arctic. Well, okay. That's actually a good thing for your safety and a good thing for my education. Yuki, you have so many interests in your life. You've played tennis, you've organized star watch parties, you've practiced capoeira, which is a Brazilian martial arts form, you've been a Fulbright recipient, and you've become certified in scuba diving. But most recently, you've added two more certifications to your resume. A competent tower climber and a wilderness first responder. What are those last two things about? Oh yeah, those were both for uh, my job in Greenland uh, at a camp in the middle of the ice sheet in Greenland. Uh, so tower climbing was, I was working as a science technician and uh, tower climbing, we had to climb towers to service or re repair instruments. Uh, like weather stations on top of towers. Um, the other one, the wilderness first responder was at the, in Greenland in the camp. It was only six of us in a very remote place, uh, far away from any medical facility. So we had to, some of us had to be trained in to take care of like any like injuries or sickness. So yeah, that's why I did the training for that. So that's really kind of like a wilderness EMS certification? Yeah, yeah. I just hinted at when we began this interview for our viewers, we had to fit this interview in specifically this week while you were in Hawaii and have a good internet connection. Because last week you were on the Midway Atoll and next week you're going back. What are you doing there? Well, there I'm actually volunteering for six months, um, trying to help protect the birds there. Um, there are millions of uh, birds, mostly albatrosses, who have been displaced. Uh, their habitats have been displaced because of humans, mostly in the main Hawaiian islands. And also because Midway used to be a naval airfield. So we're trying to restore their uh, habitat um, with like native plants that they're used to and removing all the invasive species that um, humans introduced there and also like uh, yeah eradicating like mice red predators like mice and also there are um, in, a lot of um, endangered birds for example laysan ducks whose population is only about 700 left in the world so we monitor them and we try to every day we try to find there are any stick ducks and we if we find them we take care of them yeah and under whose auspices who are you doing this for US Fish and Wildlife Service so you're actually doing some biological work not physics or astrophysics yeah over the years I've also become very interested in working with living things uh, yeah later this fall you're heading back to Antarctica what will you be doing there well, uh, I'll be working as a research, I mean, uh, science technician there, basically at McMurdo Station, uh, supporting experiments and measurements of scientists that cannot be there. So doing various, like, uh, working on instruments to, like, study the climate or lightning or um, geology, geophysics, and uh, astronomy even. So, yeah, it's kind of like, uh, <laughs> it's kind of like being an astronaut, but in Antarctica. Is this program being overseen by NASA? No, actually this is also a National Science Foundation as a U.S. Antarctic program. Connected to NASA, I wanted to ask, over recent years, NASA has scaled back, sending far fewer people into space. Where does your own personal dream of space flight stand right now? 
Yeah, well, I've become more interested in uh, private space flight. Uh, that's why I joined、uh, SpaceX after school to、uh, work on their Dragon spacecraft to someday hopefully fly with them. So I left SpaceX for a while to, and now trying to explore this planet Earth as much as possible before going to outer space. So, but someday I hope to. Ride on, like, maybe their Dragon spacecraft or maybe with Virgin Galactic and look back at the Earth from outer space. So, being an astronaut is still in your future, potentially. Yeah, yeah. Now, over the course of your career, you've always been interested in educating others. What advice do you have for young learners today who are watching this interview? Oh, well,、um, the biggest advice I have is to. Make sure you're having fun <laughs> doing what you're doing.、Um, yeah, because、um, if you're like, too stressed or、um, something like that, like not happy, you're not really learning. Like, whenever you're not feeling, when something doesn't feel right, like, I think it's very important to step back and yeah, evaluate like, oh, could I be doing something different or could I be doing something differently or maybe change my attitude about it. So, yeah, that would be my advice. Awesome. So, my final question You were born in the U.S., you've lived or traveled to all the continents. How do you identify? Do you feel American, Japanese? Are you a citizen of the world? Who is Yuki Takahashi? I, I don't feel like either American or even Japanese.、Um, And I can't quite say yet、uh, that I'm a citizen of the world quite yet because I feel like I still have a lot more to explore to really、um, understand this world. So I just feel like I am just me. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> just a, one human being on this planet. Super. Well, we're going to have to leave it there, Yuki. But truly, it's been such a pleasure talking with you again. Safe travels across the Pacific and the Antarctic. And I just want to say mahalo and keep in touch. Yeah, you too. Keep in touch. Thank you very much. Castilian, Galician. So there's a lot of, and within that, because of a 400 year occupation, there's also Arab and Jewish blood. And you really can't tell which one you have. It's very difficult for us mestizos.